Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Nazis in the Bundestag for the first time since World War II? That was the dark picture painted by Germany's foreign minister this week as he referred to the prospect that the upcoming election could put the right-wing AFD party into parliament. And unless the latest surveys are badly mistaken, the AFD will cross the 5% threshold needed for parliamentary representation and possibly even emerge as Germany's third strongest party. Top AFD candidates insist the party simply voicing conservative citizens' concerns. Yet at least one party leader is under investigation for alleged hate speech. AFD positions are divisive, so much so that, that the German justice minister considers part of the election platform unconstitutional. Just how dangerous is the party that calls itself alternative for Germany? Are they a real alternative or a threat? Those are the questions we want to talk about on Quadriga. And here are my guests. It's a pleasure to welcome Barbara Junge. She's deputy editor-in-chief of the German daily newspaper, The Taz. And she says, in this upcoming election for the first time in post-war history, right-wing extremists will be elected to the German parliament. And to me, this is a threat. And pleasure to have Malte Leming on the show once again. He's an editor for the daily newspaper, the Tagesspiegel. He says Germany can cope with the AFD. 10% right-wing populists won't harm democracy. And finally, we're very glad to have Job Janssen with us. He is a Dutch freelance journalist with a focus on right-wing populism. He says, the exclusion of politically disenchanted people by established parties is far more dangerous than the inclusion of the AFD. Robert Junge, let me start out by uh, quoting your uh, opening statement there. You say you see this as a threat. Would you go so far as Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel when he says that the election could wind up putting Nazis in parliament? Uh, it was a drastic warning by uh, Sigma Gabriel. It was a warning 10 days before the election, so I understand that it's a political thing. But still, you quoted me. It's a uh, right-wing extremists, for sure, that will be in a parliament, that will be sitting in the in a Reichstag, yeah. And that's a threat, sure. Malte Leming, your opening statement said that the AFD is no real fundamental threat, but some of its leaders are under investigation for language that uh, is possibly incitement to hatred and division uh, under the German constitution. Do you think that a parliamentary presence of this party would wind up giving a platform to such thoughts and possibly lowering the threshold for hateful rhetoric? Yes, definitely. I would be more than happy if they wouldn't uh, uh, come above the 5% threshold. It would not be represented in parliament. I would be more than happy. But if they are, would that mean a threat to democracy? I would very much doubt that. If one or two persons under investigation, would that, does that mean they already are convicted of, of violating certain, certain things? I don't think so. Under investigation means the judges are investigating. And if they find something that is, that is forbidden to say in Germany, they should punish them. That's, that's how, how it goes and that's what the future will be. Jeb Janssen, we're hearing some very vocal bashing of the AFD from Germany's established parties. Would you say that helps or hurts the AFD's chances in the election? Well, I think it, it, it helps the AFD in the elections because, you know, the established parties now uh, actually um, show that, uh, you know, they, they, the AFD is uh, a party that's standing outside of the establishment. And the motive for many voters is to vote for a party that is not within the inner circle of the Berlin politics. So it doesn't uh, damage the AFD at all. Barbara Junge, let's take a look at the AFD's chances. For a while this spring, it looked like they almost might self-destruct. And now we're seeing this sudden upturn in the poll numbers. What's behind that? Oh, that's a change of the, of the public uh, discussion. I'm sure, but also it's a, it's a question of how they, they campaign, because their campaign is now growing. They have uh, quite a force behind them, and they're spreading like out uh, the, um, their positions. I think that's behind it, because that's what we've seen in the, in the US as well. That's what we've seen in France. So that's, at least that's part about it, I would say. The AFD's poll numbers are all the more remarkable because the party has become increasingly extreme since its founding in 2013. Originally born as an EU skeptic party, it has reinvented itself as the voice of anti-immigration anger. Let's take a look at the party leadership and the issues. 
Alice Weidel and Alexander Gauland. They're something of an odd couple. 76-year-old Gauland is head of the National Conservative Wing, while the young businesswoman leads the moderate economic camp. Their common goal is to take the AFD into parliament. Dear friends, we need Russia as a Christian bulwark against an Islamic land grab. And it's time that we took a defensive stance. Our external borders are standing wide open. Since 2015, people from all over the world have been coming here without identity papers, without us knowing who they are. Enough of what we've been calling climate protection. And that means quitting all the national and international agreements related to it. The AFD's many faces. Are they policy or blatant populism? Matalimin, policy or populism? And to what degree is this leadership duo one reason for the recent upturn in support? I don't think it's, it's so much reason. I don't think that, that these two candidates... I, I personally think they could uh, have, have a dog in, 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 uh, as, as, uh, that people could elect, and they still would have 8 or 9 percent. So I don't think uh, Alexander Gauland or Alice Weidel are very good eloquently speakers, charismatic persons, some kind of this. I doubt that very much. It's kind of a movement, anti-climate uh, change, First of all, anti-refugee policy, anti-Europe, anti-all these things. And um, I think it's, it's, it's not so relevant who is on the top. Anti, anti, anti. But in particular, the overarching theme, anti-globalization? That is, that is one of these words that needs to be explained. Yes, anti-globalization in the sense that, that many things that comes with globalization um, are liberal, cultural liberalism, um, global point of view, not being so nationalistic. They want to go back to nationalistic policies, to Bismarck kind of policies, and so on and so on. So they think many developments that happened in the past are to, are to be uh, against that. Yo, I, oh, Barbara, no, please. I, yeah. But still, I don't understand why you say it's not a threat, because all you mentioned is, is going backwards, is going backwards um, beyond... Uh, or before the point of uh, policies of friendship, of consensus that, that build the uh, post-war era. So that's, that's a threat to me. It's a threat to the trans uh, transatlantic relations. It's a threat to the EU. If we talk about 10 or 15 percent that the AFD might, might become the next election, we have 10 or 50 percent represented for all these things I've just mentioned. There are 85 percent of parties that have a consensus about Europe, about the refugee policy, about climate change, and, but all these other things, and none of these parties will ever go into a coalition with these parties like, like they did in other European countries. So I, I can't see how, how this, will, this will change the public discourse, but it will not change actual policy. Jupp Jensen, your opening statement talked about uh, the exclusion of uh, many people in the population from political discourse. Would you say that these two candidates are perhaps giving voice to a, a resentment against political correctness of the sort that we see as uh, from supporters of, of someone like Donald Trump? Yes, uh, absolutely, and I, I also don't agree that it doesn't really matter which which leader is on the top of uh, is leading this party. I think uh, we've seen uh, Gauland and we've seen uh, uh, Alice Weidel being extremely amateuristic. Their timing is bad. Their party is uh, badly organized. When they enter. Uh, the Bundestag uh, this term, that also means that their party is going to learn, that this party, that their profile is going to be strengthened, that they have a national platform. Um, these parties change uh, over the years. I think they had a very stormy phase behind them. Um, uh, and as we've seen with Geert Wilders or with Le Pen, uh, what these parties are learning um, in, in, in the first few years in parliament is how to attract multiple uh, groups in society. So it starts with the more ex um, um, extreme voters, maybe, who um, are really, uh, you know, uh, yeah, don't want to be part of the establishment anymore, but 
all of a sudden, uh, SPD voters, Grüne voters, also uh, more CDU voters, they cross the moral line and think like, okay, they show quite some competence in Bundestag. Um, I can support them maybe the next time. So the thresh, the moral threshold is getting lower. Let's come back to the implications of a, a, a presence in the parliament, perhaps a, a little bit later. But let me ask, uh, because you talk about giving them a platform, let me ask Barbara Junge, what kind of sentiments we uh, might see a platform uh, being given to. We've heard this week about an email allegedly written by Ms. Weidel in which she voiced pretty rabid xenophobia. And as we mentioned, German prosecutors are investigating mm -hmm. Mr. Gauland for statements that they say may uh, violate Germany's prohibition on uh, violations of human dignity. Those statements uh, called for Germany's integration minister to be, quote unquote, disposed of in Turkey. Would you say that this is a level of hate speech that in fact violates the Constitution? I don't think it violates the Constitution. Perhaps it violates the criminal law, but the Constitution, we have quite a, a, a good thing of uh, free speech, not as as open as in the US, but still it's not the Constitution. For me, it's, it's two directions. So for one, um, the, the being elected to the Bundestag means it's it's a door open for right wing extremists to to like stream into the Bundestag, and then you have the the other direction spreading in the other direction. So that's for me the the real um, bad thing. And then there's the the one uh, oldest. Um, member of the AFD to be um, elected, uh, got back um, talking about the, the Jewish uh, myth of Holocaust. He was quoting an, an Italian Nazi, but still, that's, that's the kind of language that, that could violate the uh, Constitution, yeah? Malte Leming, would you say that we are seeing a kind of a watershed in German history. The, for, the Financial Times recently wrote that until now, the German experience of the Second World War, Germany's history, has inoculated it against the rise of a racist, anti-Semitic right wing. Has that somehow dissolved, that inoculation? I would not call them Nazis, as our foreign minister, Sigmar Gabriel, did. Um, I'm very careful with all these descriptions, because if you call the AFD politicians Nazis, you, you say, in a sense, they are like Hitler. If they are like Hitler, Hitler was not so awful as we all think. So it makes a relativation of our own past. We should be very, very careful in using these terms. They are not Nazis. Uh, they are voted for a, a number of reasons. I doubt that, it's, that anti Semitism is the first of all from the first of all is the refugee policy. The refugee policy, to be critical against the refugee policy, was not represented in parliament by none of the parties that are now into it. So it's the only party that is, is, is voicing uh, skepticism about the refugee policy. We didn't have a, an open European discussion in Germany because of our past. We all think we have to be good Europeans because of our bad past as Germans. So, so even the discussion about the level that we have to talk about our the dark sides of our past is 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 is, is, is I, I don't like the discussion, but it's a it's a legal discussion to to to, to go through. You have to mention there are neo Nazis in in this party, or they are close to to groups. So it's not Nazis in the parliament, but there are in this party, and we know it. And uh, that's that's a threat. Yes. Let me ask you, Jensen, because of course you come from a country that does also have quite a strong far right uh, presence in politics. How do you see the AfD and the situation in Germany in comparison, for example, to that in the Netherlands? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Germany is relatively late having a right wing populist party uh, that's entering parliament. Um, and I think it has to do with um, uh, it has, has to do with more than just a refugee crisis, just with uh, more than dissatisfaction with the euro. This is a problem that in whole Western Europe the party systems have in the last 20 years. 
Um, established parties have forgotten a large part of the German voters, the disenchanted voters, as I call them, um, on a few main topics. That's on the negative side of the multicultural society. That's the negative effects of Europeanization. And the a disc a discourse about these topics was not possible. Every party, especially in the right, uh, who wanted to start this discourse was directly being framed as uh, being extreme right or a Nazis party. And I think that's a, that, that includes a big danger because these people feel neglected by politics for 10, 20 years already. Uh, and this is their anger coming out now. And the refugee policy of the refugee crisis was the symbolic moment for the AFD um, that, that people got over this moral uh, threshold. So, but the, the, the difference with, uh, the, for instance, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands is that um, within the AFD, there are definitely extremist groups. Uh, the AFD is being infiltrated by extremist groups with um, re ideo uh, ideologies uh, that you won't see with Geert Wilders, for instance. Geert Wilders is, very, is, a, is, is basically a liberal who just doesn't want is, uh, Islamization uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And he only talks about freedom and the strength of Wilders. And what, that's what the AFD is in, in, uh, incapable of doing, is including other minorities in the party. So the AFD is very nativistic. It's actually a little bit about the white German... But he is stronger anti-Islam and stronger Islamophobic than the AFD Definitely. is. I, I want to delve deeper into the topics and attractions for AFD supporters. But because you mentioned uh, the established parties, let us take a look at the leader of one of the established parties, the Chancellor herself, campaigning in her own district where AFD support is on the rise. The Chancellor campaigns in her Mecklenburg Vorpommern home region, but gets whistles and boos. I think building Germany's future on whistles will lead nowhere. The 2017 campaign is different. The German flags are thinning out. Surveys are giving the alternative for Germany 20% and more in Mecklenburg Vorpommern. The euro crisis, energy reform and the immigration crisis after she opened the borders on her own. And we say we want to send Ms. Merkel back home. Merkel has won every direct mandate here. More and more voters feel alienated, most of all by Angela Merkel's refugee policies. Ms. Merkel opens her arms wide and says, come in, everyone. As I see it, letting all these asylum seekers in just wasn't well thought out. It went all wrong. Did Merkel disregard a widespread fear of foreigners and give the AFD a boost? Barbara Junge, Mecklenburg Vorpommern is an area that has been through profound structural change over the last 25 years, basically since the fall of the wall. In many respects, it almost resembles a state like Iowa in the United States, which of course gives strong, strong support to Donald Trump. So, question to you. Is this really only about that fateful decision in 2015 to take in refugees, or is it about deep-seated structural change and its effects? Oh, it's absolutely about the, the deep-seated um, um, uh, um, changes that took place there. Um, we toured the whole country the last year, for one year, and we, we learned really from the people um, uh, democracy is not served for free. You have to discuss with them. You have to see what is really um, a problem in all those places. And not only America, I think most of the established party didn't uh, look into it. Malte Leming, polls seem to show that many of the AFD supporters are by no means at the bottom of the economic pyramid. So what's driving the frustration and the anger? Um, let me try to be, to be superbly fair uh, towards the AFD. I mean, they warned about a lot of uh, developments that really took place. They warned about rising criminality. They warned about uh, um, uh, integration problems. They warned about homophobia. They warned about uh, everything that comes with refugees, and which is a real problem. And it has. It, it was admitted by the by the by the old parties just after months after months after months. I don't share all these concerns. I think we we can do it. I think we can integrate them, and I'm very optimistic about it. But if you have to be fair to them, their feeling is, um, we were the first who warned you. And now you're proving with your policy, and Merkel has changed tremendously in her policy, with closing the borders with Turkey, with the, with the Mediterranean, with the, uh, all the, uh, that no family members can, can come, come home, and so on and so on. So she switched 
her own policy under the influence of everything the AfD warned her of. Jupp Janssen, from outside, mm -hmm. Germany looks to many people in the world like Europe's calm and prosperous island yes. in the middle of a turbulent sea. What do mm -hmm. the Dutch make of developments here? I think the Dutch also think this. Uh, that's my job as a journalist here. Uh, is also uh, to show people that a lot of things happen under the surface in Germany. Uh, a lot of things you don't really see, uh, also not in, on the highest platform, like in the Bundestag. We also had a time, of course, that German media was largely ignoring uh, problems with, uh, with migrants, as we have seen uh, with, around uh, Cologne uh, that, that, and, and Sylvester night. Um, so Cologne on the New Year's Eve. New Year's uh, Eve, yes, yeah. of course. And um, I think, uh, you know, they, they, many Dutch people think like, well, the, the, the AFD is like a copy of, of Geert Wilders. Uh, but I think uh, and, and they, people don't realize that there is this, also this extremist, um, extremist stream within this, uh, within this party. And that, that's, I see that as my job also to explain uh, this to, uh, to the Dutch public. Okay, given that stream, let us very briefly come back to our title and talk about the degree to which this could be a threat. AFD is going to be represented in Parliament. There's no question about that. Barbara Junge, two possible alternatives, at least uh, as I see it. One would be that the bloom wears off once they're in the limelight. The other one would be they get that platform we've been talking about and uh, it has an enormous uh, impact on public opinion. How do you see it? And they get the platform. So I agree with the extremists. We have been talking about it. The platform will make them uh, rise even, I think. I don't think they will rise above, let's, let's say, 15%. There was always a, a certain amount of, of people in Germany who had right-wing or extremist views, and they were not represented in the party. Now they are represented in the party, but the party, I can't see why it rise. I mean, we have, we have two deterrents, the Brexit and the Trump election in the USA. That works as a deterrent because it shows where right-wing populism leads us to. This is not a, an example that... that, that, that if you see it on TV, that many people admire. So I think right-wing populism isn't on the rise. We saw the election results in France, even in, in, in Holland, and we will see them now in 15%. I think 15% is, is European normality. Yeah, but over the whole line, uh, populism and right-wing populism in Europe is still rising compared to 10 years ago. So it's not that the movement has been stopped. Uh, that's We have to think, be, be careful about this. What will also happen when the AFD enters the Bundestag, as you've said before, uh, many of the, uh, especially CDU, uh, CSU, they copy their policy points and they also copy their rhetorics. Uh, the only thing the AFD can do is then is further radicalize in tone, further radicalize in, in, in their position. We have seen that with Wilders, we've seen that also in other countries. Um, so, and that's, uh, that's definitely a big threat. So we need a, definitely a political alternative um, in Bundestag from other parties, especially from the left parties. And um, in the Netherlands, it never really succeeded. In other countries, it never really succeeded. That's the big challenge. And Germany can show that they can do it this time. That uh, essentially poses the question, Barbara Junge, can the established parties, including the smaller parties, rise to the threat and essentially uh, help uh, the voters, the citizens, to see uh, the AFD for what it is? Yes, sure. I said uh, democracy is not served for free, but you can work for it. And uh, we should work uh, sooner and harder than uh, um, activists did in the U.S. Parliamentary democracy, of course, means coalitions. What would you think might be the best coalition to lead Germany in uh, a parliament that will include uh, the far right? The best? I don't know what the outcome will be. So um, for me, it's always a, a, a left coalition, but that's not realistic. That's the point. I would say if there is a, a, a strong left, it would help, but it's not strong enough at the moment. I, I think the Jamaica coalition would be the Jamaica would be the CDU and the FDP. We have to the explain Greens. this Jamaica. Yes. Jamaican yes. flag, yes, that's, of that's course, includes black, yeah. yellow and green. And yes. those are the party colors of? <laughs> Correct. The Liberals, the Greens and the governing CDU right now, because that would put the SPD in the opposition. It would be the strongest opposition party. Um, I have, I'm a little bit afraid about the AFD being the strongest opposition party because then they have some parliamentary rights, for example, to be the first 
first speaker, uh, mm -hmm. if, the, if the government uh, is announcing something to, to answer them, and so on and so on. There are a number of, of rights that come with being the strongest opposition parties. I think the SPD is the strongest opposition party can help the, the AFD a little bit in check. Jörg Janssen? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I think um, the uh, Jamaica coalition so is actually a, a replacement of uh, the Grand Coalition uh, in, in a certain way. Um, what we see, in, not only uh, in, in the Netherlands, but in other European countries as well, it, is, it are the right parties, uh, the right wing parties. Uh, I'm not talking about AFD here, but the FDP and, and CSU, CDU, who are... The Chancellor's Conservatives and the Liberals. Exactly. They are actually the most successful in countering populist parties, um, because these are the right parties who better understand that this is not a struggle about social economic topics, but about social cultural topics, um, about um, security issues, about integration issues. Um, and uh, right wing parties understand it better. So to, to, if you want to keep the AFD a small party, a right coalition would be better. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Hope to see you soon.